Okay, so before we go on, I'm going to preface this. Molecular orbital theory tends to be the more difficult of the two theories to grasp. I've tried to figure out the easiest way to present this over the years, and so this is pretty much the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to explain this as, as, as broadly as I can, and we'll go from there. All right, so easiest way to, to start is to take a look at the hydrogen molecule and apply quantum mechanics to this. Okay, now remember back in quantum mechanics that we can't figure out how the hydrogen atom looks with one high, with one electron, but and we can do it with one, but we can't do it with any other atom that has more than one electron. Same thing applies. We can't solve it directly, but we can make approximations that gets us pretty close to it. Okay, so what we're doing is taking a look at molecular orbitals, and that's what we're doing in molecular orbital theory. So we're forming these things called molecular orbitals, and these are these are similar to atomic orbitals. Okay, so these are going to be the S, P, D, and Fs that we're talking about previously. So these are similar to atomic orbitals because they hold two electrons with opposite spins. And we can determine the probability of finding an electron somewhere in that atomic orb, uh, somewhere in that molecular orbital. So think of it this way. Let's say you've got when you when you have I'm trying to think of the easiest way to, to describe this, and, and you guys can't see me, so I apologize. So think of it this way. Let's say we take a 1s orbital from hydrogen, okay, and then we take another 1s orbital from hydrogen. When you take those orbitals, those atomic orbitals, and you try to combine them. According to, according to the Schrodinger wave equation, you have a 50-50 prob probability that when you add them together, let, let's say you're, you're taking one part of a wave, let's say that that's the 1s orbital, and you take another 1s orbital, if they're in the same, if they're sinking upright, okay, you're going to create a bigger wave, okay? So that's 50% that's of the time that you will be able to add those together and you get a bigger wave. But let's say sometimes you could have one that's out of sync. So let's say you have a red, or let's say you have one atomic orbital that's blue and one that's red. And what happens, because they're not coordinated, they're not the same color, you end up creating a node, and if you guys remember back in chapter 8 when we talked about this, a node is a place where the electrons can't be. They can't reside at. So you have a 50-50 probability of forming a bonding molecular orbital where are the two blues combine, or you got two waves combined and they, they get a bigger wave, or you could form something called an antibonding molecular orbital. Where in this case, you're adding to two waves, the two waves end up, end up canceling each other out, and you create a node. You create a space where the electrons can't be. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write this out what we're talking about. So when we add up, when we put the two hydrogen 1s orbitals together, you get two two solutions. One that's gonna be like this. The first solution, MO1, is gonna be the 1s orbital from hydrogen A plus the 1s orbital from hydrogen B, and you get a bonding molecular orbital. Okay, and that's what we're talking about here. The other solution is this, where you have the 1s orbital from hydrogen A, and it ends up subtracting the other one from hydrogen B. And so that gives you an anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay, 
So whenever you're adding atomic orbitals together, not only are you going to form a bonding molecular orbital, but you'll also form an anti-bonding molecular orbital. You can't have one without the other. Okay, so important notes before we go forth, forward. The electron probability of both MOs is centered along the line passing through the two nuclei. For the first molecular orbital, the electron will stay between the two nuclei. For the anti-bonding molecular orbital, the electron will be on either side. So that means... If, if I'm drawing a line through both nuclei, the electron is going to be somewhere in that region, okay, between the two nuclei. If, if we're looking at the antibonding molecular orbital, the electron is either going to be over here or it's going to be over here. It can't go from one to the other, okay. So the second thing, bonding molecular orbitals are going to be lower in energy. Are, are only I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Only molecular orbitals exist and not atomic orbitals. So once you combine the 1s orbitals, that's it. They're going to be molecular orbitals and not atomic orbitals. Okay. The third point, and this is what I was trying to say earlier, the bonding molecular orbitals are lower in energy than the antibonding. Okay. Now the labels on the MOs indicate the symmetry or shape, the parent atomic orbitals, and whether they're going to be bonding or antibonding. So if we're going to write, rewrite the, the solution that we have for the bonding and the antibonding molecular orbital, we'll start with this one. How do we indicate that we have a bonding molecular orbital? So for MO1, which again, that was when they add up together. Okay, so let me write that out. So for molecular orbital one, we indicate that we have a sigma, which is the single bond. It's coming from the 1s orbital. So I write that as subscript. And then superscript, I write nothing. And so this indicates that we have a bonding molecular orbital. Now for the other one, where it's going to be anti-bonding, which remember that was the 1s minus the 1s, Okay, I'm going to write the same thing. Sigma to indicate the single single bond. 1s and subscript to indicate that that's where it's coming from. But to show that it's an anti-bonding molecular orbital, I'm going to write in superscript, I'm going to put an asterisk, which indicates that we have an anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay. So what's really cool, and this is why, why we're setting it up this way, is that molecular orbital configurations can be written just like electronic configurations. Okay, and, and the also the number of orbitals are conserved. So the number of molecular orbitals are going to be equal to the number of atomic orbitals used to construct them. All right, so let's put this all together. Let's try to solve, let's try to write the molecular orbital configuration for H2. What would that look like? All right, so in you've got a hydrogen bonded to a hydrogen. You've got the electronic configuration is 1s1 for both of these hydrogen atoms. Okay. So what we're going to do is start with the electronic. I'm going to write this as an orbital, orbital diagram. So here's the 1s electron from, from one hydrogen. And over here on the right-hand side, I'm going to write the, hydro, the 1s, or I'm going to put the electronic configuration for the other hydrogen. So because keep in mind, we got to make sure, according to poly exclusion principle, that we have uh, unpaired, you know, we make sure that this pairs are spin, or the, the spins are paired. I need to make sure that I have one electron with spin up and one electron spin down. Okay. So I combine both of these atomic orbitals to form molecular orbitals. So what I'm going to do is draw a line 
at the bottom in the middle of all this. And so this is going to represent the sigma 1s, the bonding molecular orbital. Okay. Now at the top, I'm going to kind of form like a box or a diamond. So at the top over here, this is going to be the antibonding, the sigma 1s star. And sometimes books get really fancy and they have diagonal lines that connect all these to show that these orbitals are, these molecular orbitals are coming from these atomic orbitals. Okay, all right. So in the, in the center, those are the molecular orbitals that we just created from the 1s, or that we made from the 1s. So remember, we follow the same rules like we did with Aufbau. We start with the lowest molecular orbital and build up. So we've got two electrons. Those two electrons have to go into the sigma 1s. And there it is. So according to what we've got, the molecular, to answer this question, the molecular orbital configuration for H2, the, con, the molecular orbital configuration would be sigma, 1s, and then in superscript, I'd write 2. And there it is. That's the answer. All right. So that's the molecular orbital configuration for H2. What if, and here's the next question, what about if you had H2 minus? How does that work? So I'm going to do this one in red, so that way it may, it's a little bit clearer. So we're going to assume that one of the hydrogens is actually bringing over an extra electron. Okay, so let's make that one the one on the right. Okay. So again, we start with the sigma 1s, and we have two electrons in there, we've got an extra electron, which means we've got to put that extra electron in the sigma 1s star molecular orbital. So for H2 minus, the molecular orbital configuration would be sigma 1s2, sigma 1s star 1. Okay. So to answer that on the, the next line, sigma 1s2, sigma 1s star 1. All right. Now, the next thing is that, in a sense, H2 is stronger than H2 minus because it doesn't have that anti-bonding electron. So how do we show that? How do we show that H2 is actually stronger than H2 minus? So to, to do that, we got to calculate something called bond order. Okay. So the way that we calculate bond order, or BO, okay, BO, or bond order, is going to be equal to the number of bonding electrons, okay, minus the number of anti-bonding electrons divided by 2. Now, bond order, another way to think of bond order, this is going to be the number of bonds that can form. Okay, so that's really what we're talking about when we're calculating bond order. How many bonds can form between these two atoms? So for H2, the, num the bonding order, well, let's try to calculate this. You've got two bonding electrons. You've got no anti-bonding electrons divided by two. Two minus zero gives us two. Divided by two gives us one. So we form one bond between hydrogens. Okay, that's cool. Now for H2 minus, though, the bond order, we had two bonding electrons minus one anti-bonding. So two minus one gives us one. Divided two by two gives us one half. So we form half a bond. So half a bond would form an H2 minus. So that's that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. That would... The figure, the the elect, the Lewis structure would look something like this. You would have hydrogen bonded to hydrogen, and you'd have half a bond. Okay. All right. So if we're close up here, we're close to getting. I mean, we have two electrons in one s uh, for one of the one s hydrogens. You've got another electron. If we add in one more electron, which that would almost be like, that would be isoelectronic like helium. So 
What would the molecular orbital configuration of bond order look like for AG2? So let's try that. So each heat, you'd have two helium atoms, and you're trying to form a bond. Between, you're trying to figure out how many bonds form between them. Each helium brings in two electrons. So that means you're going to have sigma 1s. Then you're going to have sigma 1s star. Okay. You're going to have two electrons in sigma 1s. You're going to have two electrons in sigma 1s star. So that means for He2, the, the molecular orbital configuration would be sigma 1s2, sigma 1s star, 2. The bond order, you'd have 2 bonding minus 2 anti-bonding. 2 minus 2 is 0. Divided by 2 is still 0. So that means no bonds would form. And so this is actually the cool part. You can actually say, you can actually show that two atoms are not going to form a bond. And that's why when we, when I know you guys asked this in class earlier, like way at the beginning of the semester, how do you know that this atom is going to be diatomic and this one isn't? That's exactly why. That's exactly why. Okay, so if that's helium, HE2, what about Li2, which would be the next one? What about two lithium atoms coming together? All right, so keep in mind that lithium, one lithium atom is going to have the electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s1. Okay, so that means you're going to have another lithium over here, same deal, 1s2, 2s1. So to construct that, you're going to start with a sigma 1s. After that, you're going to go to sigma 1s antibonding. All right, after 1s, you've got 2s, which means you're going to have the sigma 2s, and that means you're going to have a sigma 2s antibonding. So every time you make a bonding molecular orbital, you've got an antibonding. You've got six electrons between the two lithium atoms. So I'm going to put them in. Two in the sigma 1s. Two in the sigma 1s antibonding. And then two in the sigma 2s. So for lithium, the molecular orbital configuration would be sigma 1s2, sigma 1s star 2, sigma 2s. Two. The bond order would be you'd have four bonding electrons minus two anti-bonding electrons. Four minus two is two divided by two is one. So one bond would form between lithium and lithium. All right, so based on what we saw with the hydrogen molecule, H2 minus, and then the helium molecule, which doesn't exist, and lithium, it appears that there's going to be some sort of off bow or some sort of building up of, of order that we got to put the molecule, we got to fill the molecular orbitals. And that's where we're headed. Okay. That's where we're headed to go. Now, the fun, and it kind of makes sense. You start with the you start with the sigma one s, then you go to the antibonding, then you go to the sigma two s, and then you go to the antibonding for that one. So it makes sense. So getting the beryllium be two, we can do that. Now the fun really begins when we get to boron and we start adding in the p orbitals. Okay, so the electronic configuration of boron, which should should be something like this: one s two. Sigma 1s, um, sorry, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. So you're going to have five boron electrons for a, for a single boron atom. Okay, so if you have two borons, you'd have 10 electrons. Now, when two boron atoms approach each other, the two pairs of p orbitals can overlap in a parallel fashion, and one pair can overlap head on. Okay, so that would be like you'd have something like this. They'd over, overlap head on, and then you're going to have one sticking up, and then one like this. 
Okay, so kind of like we what we saw earlier. So the p orbitals are gonna you're gonna have one that's gonna overlap straight on. Then you're gonna have the other sets of p orbitals that's gonna form the pi bond. So remember the one that overlaps directly that's your sigma. The ones that are gonna be perpendicular these are your pi's. Okay, so with the p orbitals you're gonna possibly form sigma and pi bonds. All right, so we expect the sigma 2s or the sigma 2p's to have lower energy than the pi 2p's. So the order that we would fill in the electrons would be this. So this would be the off bound. We start with sigma 1s. Then we go to sigma 1s antibonding. After that, it's going to be sigma 2s and then sigma 2s antibonding. Okay. Once we get there, then we deal with the two P's. So we would do sigma 2P, and then we would do the pi's. You're going to have pi, two, two P's. Okay. After you get to do the pi two P's, then you're going to do all the antibonding. So you're going to have pi two P antibonding, pi two P antibonding, and then sigma 2p antibonding. So that's pretty much the order in which we're going to put the electrons in. So that being said, let's try to do, let's calculate the bond order for B2. Okay, so I'm going to use this off bow that we just figured out. That's the order in which we're going to put the electrons in. So let's start, start with this. Remember for B2, each boron brings over five electrons, so we got 10 electrons total. So we're going to start. I'm going to draw the simplified uh, st structure so that way we don't have to deal with the... Uh, we're going to assume that the electrons are coming from the atomic orbitals. We're combining them to form molecular. So we're just dealing with just the molecular orbital configuration. So you're going to have two electrons in sigma of 1x. After that, you're moving on to... The, the antibonding. So you got sigma 2s, or sigma 1s, 2, antibonding, two electrons there. After that, we got to go to the sigma 2s. Okay, and you've got two electrons in there. So you got six electrons used up. After the bonding, we go to the antibonding. So sigma 2s antibonding, sigma 2s star. You've got two electrons in there. So you've got eight electrons. After that, you move on to the, according to this, we're going to the sigma 2p. All right, so we're going to put two electrons in there. All right, so there it is. We've used up all 10 electrons. We're good. All right, so to calculate the bond order, you've got 2, 4, 6. Okay, so you've got six bonding electrons minus 2, 4 antibonding. So 6 minus 4 is 2, divided by 2 gives you a bond order of 1. So you would form a single bond between the, bo between, the, between the boron and the boron. Okay, cool. All right, so there is a problem with this, though. There is a problem. This is, so the bond order is 1. That's absolutely right. But the order in which we put the electrons is an issue. And to, to explain that, i got to define two more terms. These have come up in other places in the textbook, and I've avoided those words until now. So paramagnetism, this causes a substance to be attracted to a magnetic field. Okay. And diamagnetism causes a substance to be repelled by a magnetic field. Okay, so what, you know, okay, so you've got paramagnetism where some, something's attracted to a molecular field. You've got diamagnetism where it's being repelled. So what does that have to do with us? Well, param if something is paramagnetic, what that means is that 
in order to be attracted to a molecular field, you've got to have unpaired electrons. Okay, and if it's diamagnetic, you've got to have paired electrons because that's the only way it's going to be repelled. So according to what we're, we've got right here, we're saying that B2 should be, or based on what we're seeing with this problem, B2 is diamagnetic. Makes sense. All right, so that that's you know following everything that we've done so far. That's the that's the conclusion we can make. But it turns out that B two is really paramagnetic. So nature tells us it's paramagnetic. We just said it's diamagnetic. So that means that the that the off ball that we used is incorrect. There's something else going on. So we have. It turns out. For B2, C2, for boron, for carbon, and for nitrogen, we have to switch the order of the 2P. So instead of being sigma 2P, pi 2PY, pi 2PZ, we're going to do the pi's first, then we go to the sigma, then we do the pi antibonding, then we do the sigma antibonding. And then once we get that, once we get past N2, when we when we look at oxygen, O2 and F2, we can go back to the order that we just did. So anytime we're dealing with B2, C2, or N2, we've got to use, we've got to do the pi's first before we do the sigma. Okay. And then for O2 and F2, we can do the sigmas before the pi's. So if we redo this one more time, and I'll, I'm going to do this one in pot in red. The order should be like this. You're going to go sigma 1s, you got two electrons there. Sigma 1s star, you've got two electrons there. Sigma 2s, you got two electrons in there. Sigma 2s star, you got two electrons in there. So now what I'm saying is that you're going to go to the pi's, okay? So pi 2p, you've got two electrons you've got to put Two ele one electron in each of the two in the pi 2p orbitals first before you can go pair them up. Okay, so if we calculate the bond order this time, you still have two, four, six. Even though you've got two in different uh, two electrons in two different molecular orbitals, there's still two bonding molecular orbitals. So you still have six bonding molecular orbitals, or st st six bonding electrons. You still have four antibonding electrons. So six minus four is two divided by two still gives you one. But this order does make it now paramagnetic. And so now by switching the order, by going by dealing with the pi's first before the sigmas, now everything makes sense in nature. Okay. So it's just again to, to just to, to make you know make sure we're all on the same page. Whenever we're dealing with B two, C two, or N two, and pluses and minuses of those, we've got to switch up the order. We do pi, then sigma, then pi antibonding, sigma antibonding. For O two and F two, and charges with those, it's going to be sigma, pi. Pi antibonding, sigma antibonding. Okay. Finally, let's try this out. Uh, to summarize, there are definite correlations between bond order, bond energy, and bond length. And as the bond order increases, the bond energy increases, and the bond length decreases. So we finally, finally after all this, we finally have a correlation between how many bonds can form between two atoms. The, the bond order how many bonds can form, bond length, and bond energy, which is stuff that we talked about about two chapters ago. Okay, second part. Bond order cannot be automatically associated with a particular bond energy. Okay, so the length of the, so the bond order doesn't necessarily mean bond energy. So, you know, looking at B2, it's going to have a higher bond order than F2, even though the bonds are going to be different sizes. N2 is extremely stable 
with a bond order of three. So N2 wants a triple bond, not a double or a single. Okay. The last one, oxygen is going to be paramagnetic, which MO theory confirms, even though, and that's what O2 is going to be paramagnetic in nature, molecular orbital theory confirms that, valence bond theory actually says it's going to be diamagnetic. So it's kind of nice. We actually have some agreement in what's going on in nature. Like I said, um, th this is just a really, really brief overview of molecular orbital theory. As you keep going on in chemistry, when you go into organic, and if you're lucky enough to go into inorganic and, and PCHEM, you're going to get a lot more of molecular orbital theory. But this is going to be enough to get you through to, sh to, to understand what's going on for the rest of general chemistry.